Exploration and Mining Geology at the Camborne School of Mines in the UK, which is where he is today. He's also a guest lecturer in economic geology at various uh, EU locations, and is a consultant to the mining industry through Explore Global Limited. Benedict worked for Rio Tinto Exploration in Namibia and Zambia before he founded his own company, Explore Global. He's got experience in operating in challenging remote environments like Western Central Africa, Myanmar and Argentina. Benedict speaks several languages, English, German, French, Spanish, Russian and Afrikaans. And I'm wondering which one your presentation is in today, Benedict. Well, <laughs> that depends what you want, I could, but I should do English probably. <laughs> Yeah. Please go ahead. Okay, thanks very much, Nolene. Um, and thanks for inviting me once more to give a talk as part of the GSSA forum. Um, maybe some of you remember I gave a presentation last year about LCT pegmatites. And today's talk will be more educational. It will deal with educational matters such as employability and skill sets of geology students to uh, facilitate a smooth transition into industry and into employment. Now, this topic has been discussed and developed quite extensively over the last few decades. Um, but I would like to make uh, well, I would like to make an impact here by um, describing from a postgraduate master's level um, perspective how skills can be developed and um, yeah, students better prepared for starting their career in industry. So I'll start the talk with maybe a little anecdote and I will share some, uh, you know, some of the principal skills that are required and I will then move on and develop and show you a case study with examples of how um, yeah, the, the skills can be implemented at postgraduate master's level. Um, yeah, let's start may, maybe off with an, with an anecdote. Um, we all start somewhere. That's, yeah, um, all of us have started somewhere, but the question is, how do we start off our career in industry or post-graduation? And this photo here um, shows me um, more than 10 years ago, it was in the late 2000s in Namibia, um, one of my first jobs was to work on the Rossing uranium site. Probably you all know about it uh, being based in Southern Africa. And I was finishing quite recently from university and was um, part of this project. And I was sort of dropped into the cold water and had to run drilling rigs and drilling programs and so on. Now, <clears throat> Unfortunately, I didn't have, I didn't have this, well, the, the knowledge from university to just go and run drill rigs and drilling programs straight away. So there was a steep learning curve involved. And most of my other colleagues who were in the same position back in the day, they, we all had to be somewhat trained up in industry. And um, they had to show us how you do core logging, how you do sampling, QAQC, and so on. Um, over the years then, I found that, well, we need to do something about it. We need to implement courses or programs that actually prepare students at undergraduate and postgraduate level for the jobs that are, um, they will, that, that the jobs that are awaiting them uh, when they start a career and get a job in industry. And that's really the, the point I would like to make and I give you a couple of examples how this can be implemented. So um, let's take a very quick look at what are the actual graduate skills uh, expected by the mining industry. And if you just go through the obvious job portals online and in the, in, in the internet, you will come across some of some job descriptions that state, oh, you, you need to be a graduate, but you need to have five years of experience. Well, that sort of is a bit strange that um, doesn't really work out, does it? They also want solid geoscience foundation and technical skills, right? Um, very interestingly, not many job advertisements actually um, specify geological mapping, 
as a key skill. That's, that's something to take note of. And usually the solid geoscience foundation and technical skills, you would expect these to be developed during undergraduate bachelor's or honors degrees, um, where really students learn about geology, um, making field observations, um, thinking in 3D and so on. These job descriptions also mention that you should have um, a knowledge of all deposit models and investigation techniques. Um, that's also usually covered in undergraduate and postgraduate um, degrees in terms of economic geology. And importantly, uh, maybe that's not necessarily something that's been advertised uh, on the web, but it's if you talk to people, um, they expect graduates to um, be ready and to almost like plug and play on exploration and mining sites, right? So minimum training needed, people just come on the site and do their jobs. Um, last year, I wrote an article with my colleague Hannah Hughes and we sort of went into a bit more detail. We um, did a literature review on the on published um, skill requirements. And I mean, that table down there is a bit intense, but the, there are some important um, points here that uh, companies are requiring. And that is, for example, um, being aware of um, advanced prospecting techniques or using big data. Big data is really becoming sort of mainstream, um, a mainstream, mainstream skill and technique that people need to develop, whether that is artificial intelligence or, or the awareness and ability to interpret um, a variety of geoscientific data sets um, using advanced statistics. Um, so there are a number of geotechnical skills that are required, but there are also soft skills, of course, such as verbal and written communication skills, especially when you work in a multicultural team and a multidisciplinary team, as well as uh, being able to uh, integrate and foster an inclusive workforce environment. So a number of these geotechnical and soft skills um, they are taught at, a, at universities, um, but really, I think we can all sort of work to improve this and um, integrate some, some other angles on how we design our, our educational curricula and um, study programs to really facilitate this smooth transition. Now, what is the reality of um, graduates when they enter the, the industry. In my anecdote before, I gave you a bit of a, an example, but if I sort of generalized it a bit more, um, the observations that I made over the years were that many graduates actually do not possess these uh, fabulous five years of working experience. Um, some of them have not even had any contact with industry. And they've just studied, completed their program, and then they're at the end of this asking, well, where can we go? Um, unfortunately, graduates also sometimes lack the solid field work, report writing, and numerical interpretation skills. And I wonder whether, whether this is a result of COVID-19, because we can't actually go into the field at the moment or whether there is a deeper issue that's affecting um, this. Maybe give you another example. When I graduated in the late 2000s, um, everyone wanted to go to Africa and do um, these fly in, fly out rotational field work in these remote and um, yeah, quite challenging locations. Um, many of my colleagues and classmates at the time did this job. But if I look now at uh, graduates, they seem to be more comfortable with these uh, computer applications and doing computer geology, GIS, and so on. Well, that's at the moment during COVID, that's perhaps what's happening. But I see a trend developing that um, not, not many geologists uh, want to stay for a long time in the field and um, carry out this essential 
field work that requires rock and mineral recognition and so on. So in essence, not many people are prepared to spend long stints in the bush, right? Um, like it ha happened 10, 10 or more years ago. Um, and also I noticed that uh, many graduates find it challenging to survive in an industry where you've constantly got time pressures, deadlines, KPIs to meet. Um, so yeah, just maybe as a summary, how I've observed the, um, the recruitment and the industry going over the last few years. The question is then, what can we do about it? And there are a number of points I would like to make here. Well, first of all, um, we need to encourage the continuation of a field work driven education. And yes, I understand it's not uh, straightforward at this very moment due to the pandemic, but um, we need to really emphasize that when we get out of it, that field work is a key skill that geoscience graduates need to um, obtain and possess. Um, and we can't have um, geoscience graduates going into field-based jobs and they hardly have any exposure to that. Uh, we also need to foster industry-specific education and research-based learning. So perhaps in terms of industry-specific education, that's not necessarily something you want to enforce at an undergraduate level, so a bachelor's level, but perhaps that's more of a, a specialized master's degree um, um, content or part of a master's uh, program where you really fine tune the skills that are um, needed for industry. So you need your undergraduate degrees where you get the solid field work and solid geoscience foundation skills. And then ideally that can be topped up with a, an additional master's degree where you have um, intense interaction with industry, with industry data sets and the workflows that are um, part of it. In terms of research-based learning, um, there is an interesting concept that was published about 15 years ago by Healy and Jenkins. Um, I think those are two geography professors in the UK who um, developed ideas how um, teaching should actually um, be redesigned and you should basically transform the students not to be part of an audience, but really participants in ongoing research, in ongoing um, um, educational activity. And perhaps if we reflect back on how we do our own teaching, we perhaps know that most of what we're doing is demonstration. We show processes. We, we tell students this is the way um, geology works. But really, I think um, the key here is that um, we we need to integrate them as participants in our own research and our own work. And we need to enable them to um, develop this critical thinking that we need as either academics or industry professionals. And that includes um, critically evaluating data, um, interpreting data, and this should essentially lead to a, a research project that's culminating in, 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 in developing these skills perhaps in an industrial environment. I know that's what generally happens at university, but I would like to use um, this theory here and apply it to um, developing master's programs and modules and therefore enhancing the, the student experience and their knowledge. So let me move on to a specific example of how this can be achieved. And I would like to introduce you some of the work I've done over the last five years um, since I've uh, joined uh, Cameron School of Mines. At CSM, we have um, a number of master's degrees and there's always been one for the last uh, three or four decades on mining geology, which focus on the entire mining value chain. But then we've set up in 2017, uh, a new exploration course, a mineral exploration course that focuses on, on um, exploration relevant education and uh, teaching. And because this 
course was set up from scratch, I could implement some of these um, conceptual ideas that I presented to you earlier on. Okay, so the aim of this very uh, industry focused MSc, in fact, is to produce graduates that have the solid geoscience foundation skills topped up with, um, with a specific exploration and mining skills that they can directly use when they um, graduate from a university in industry. I would say this exploration course is uh, one of the most applied, if not the most applied exploration MSc in the EMEA region, because it, um, it is such a focused course on um, developing exploration geologists. And how I used the, the curriculum setup is I made mining in Finland the key theme of that um, exploration course. So the um, Finland is a, is a country in Northern Europe and it's uh, one of the most active countries in Europe when it comes to mining and exploration. They've got a very, um, a very active geological survey, the GTK, and they make one of the uh, best public domain data sets available to industry. And I thought, well, I take this, what is publicly available um, and use that entire uh, concept to um, teach students GIS targeting and other sort of mining relevant skills. So um, using this as, 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 the, as the concept, I will now then sort of present some of the ideas and highlights um, behind this course so that you can see how you can um, come up with a concept for a master's program and individual modules within this program to um, really enhance the employability skills. Um, let's maybe talk, talk about the structure of the course and sort of how it sort of logically builds up and culminates. Um, and like other countries that master's degree or master's degrees in England are usually one year, they're not two years. So they're really intense um, studies where, where you hardly have any sort of long holidays um, um, during the year. And um, that academic year is subdivided into um, uh, four terms. In the, in the first term, autumn term, you've got uh, an introduction to, well, the theoretical background to all deposits, to GIS. And I already introduced the, the Finland theme here, where we use this public domain data to um, uh, introduce GIS and other software skills just at the beginning. So the foundations will be set in term one. Moving on to term two, um, probably the highlight will be to, um, practically develop geological sampling and drilling databases for, uh, for the use in Finland. So um, I put the students into a situation where they need to plan an exploration program and databases um, if they actually went to, to Finland and carried out that, that work. There will also be a large targeting exercise, which I will um, go into more detail where exactly um, the, this research-based learning will um, come into play. So using many publicly available data sets, critical thinking, evaluation of data to um, come up with targets that would then later be drilled. And um, this intense term is then followed up, well, in COVID three times normally uh, with a field trip to um, to northern Finland. Um, there, there are a number of greenstone belts, and um, students then learn about the certain ore deposits, so greenstone hosted um, orogenic gold deposits, and they will be able to ground truth the um, desktop targets that they have generated, and really um, um, test their own ideas that they've developed during term two. And I believe that's a very important point that you guide students through a certain academic or technical exercise 
but then let them see how um, how these skills can actually be developed and tested in the field. And term four is usually in summer, in European summer, um, students carry out um, a research project that's that's quite, um, yeah, quite a classic. That's what you normally do during these um, master's degrees. And they can then take their the knowledge and the techniques they learned during the previous eight months and put it into practice. And especially during COVID times now, uh, many students went back and actually carried out such desktop studies in other parts of the world, whether that is Canada, um, Greenland, um, other parts of Europe, um, or Australia, for example. So that is basically the, the structure and the concept of this, of this course. And let me present a few highlights in a bit more detail to you. I believe it's, it's very important that uh, geologists not only capture and understand geoscientific data, but they also start to manage this data. And um, <clears throat> I believe that these data management skills producing databases in Microsoft Office um, applications or in other soft specific um, database softwares is absolutely essential. <laughs> Um, so the students get a chance to develop all of these drill hole databases, um, sampling database. So if you go saw sampling or if you go stream or rock sampling or take geological measurements, um, all of this information, as we all know, goes somewhere and needs to be appropriately stored. So having this um, skill available is um, absolutely essential in our opinion. Again, they focus developing the database on the on Finland. So their focus is on exploration in formerly glaciated terrains. That's not that much of an issue in Africa, but in Northern Europe or in the Northern Hemisphere in general, um, glaciations, the tills, and the secondary dispersion is a, is a massive uh, problem and can you know um, lead to um, false positive geochemical anomalies, if you like. So uh, this needs to be yeah, properly understood and recorded. I take this a step further, this practical skill, and I ask them to implement these databases in nowadays commercially available um, GIS apps. Um, perhaps you've heard about these before. If you use S3 software, they, they offer a number of smartphone or tablet apps such as Collector for ArcGIS or Survey123. Um, those are uh, have different concepts. So whilst Collector for ArcGIS is, is in essence a mobile GIS that allows you to capture data in a geodatabase and then link it back to a cloud when you're back in the, in the office. Survey123 is much more based on a, on a table format and uh, is more focused on actually um, delivering uh, an appropriate and user-friendly layout. As you can see, um, that Survey123 template here on, on the um, right-hand side is, uh, is, is quite fine-tuned with uh, <clears throat> lots of background images and different ways of selecting um, um, the, the options for the sample you obtain. So, um, at the moment, my students are going through this and, and learning how to use Survey123 in this other collector app. And um, I've, all, I've seen this also picking up in industry. Some major consultancies start using this around the world to really streamline the data capture in the field. Um, don't get me wrong, I'm still very much in favor of having your notebook out there and making your um, sketches and your observations. But I guess in order to streamline your data capture and use databases, um, these sort of um, apps, they will become, uh, or they actually are already mainstream um, for those who, who, who subscribe to that uh, package. Um, for your interest, um, Quantum GIS, QGIS also developed such um, free freeware apps as well. Um, so you, it's called the Q Field app, uh, which you can get from your um, Android store. And they work similarly. 
but I personally think that at the moment, at least, um, these apps, they are, they are quite at the forefront of, of data capture and managing it um, uh, during field programs. Moving on, uh, one more very important um, aspect of this research-based learning is um, applying economic ge geology and all the possible geology to a practical um, scenario, a scenario that students will encounter immediately if they are released into industry and get a job with a mining or with an exploration company. As I mentioned before, um, it's all focused about Finland and the Greenstone belts there in the Arctic. And um, the, the concept is that the students are presented with um, an overview of the ore deposit model, the different research techniques that are applied in, in um, describing and interpreting greenstone belts and all deposits um, associated with them. And then they are also then demonstrated how that is practically done in a desktop study environment. And then I return the table or I I switch roles and the students will then be able to work on this data set and develop their own skills, of course, with guidance. And um, at the end of this exercise, they will have looked at a variety of geoscientific data sets, whether that is um, geological maps, mineral occurrences, airborne geophysics, including magnetics, electromagnetics, gravity. Um, they will be able to take a look at geochemistry and have worked with um, multivariate, multi-element geochemistry used advanced statistics such as supervised and unsupervised classifications um, and, and so on. And integrating this data then into a, a predictive model like a mineral potential map, you can achieve this by uh, using weighted raster overlays, fuzzy logics or more advanced techniques such as neural networks. Um, such a big amount of data should always be um, critically evaluated, especially when um, we all know that all deposits, they, they're not dependent on one factor such as structure, for example, only, but really there's an interplay of different geological processes. And therefore, uh, being able to come up with a predictive model that takes into account these a variety of geoscientific processes is absolutely important. Um, but just a technical work is not only what they're asked to do. Um, it's also important to be aware of the non-technical aspects of planning, mining or exploration campaigns. And uh, for that reason, um, there, there are certain sessions on how actually to plan exploration projects, how to um, consider all of the different impact of health and safety environments, um, uh, the country of operation, logistics, or even the budget. So um, students will also be required to think laterally and, 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 and determine what do they actually have to do to um, carry this project forward whilst yet yeah, they can generate target, but what is then needed to follow up on this? What are the logistical and the cost implications of, of this? In essence, what I've just described to you is what uh, an exploration or mining geologist is doing on a daily basis. So by learning these skills from, from the start, when you, when you um, undertake master's postgraduate study, I believe this, this will really smooth the transition into a job. I will get back to this a bit later. In this graph here, um, I'm sort of um, describing and putting everything in a bit of a timeline, what I've just said. And I list the different skills that the students develop and I link them back well to that previous um, skill set table that I've shown you earlier. And you can see there is a logical progression of skills from the initial literature study, the brainstorming, learning about the different research techniques to 
data interpretation, evaluation, and um, a presentation of, 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 of the results in a professionally written report and to, as we will see later, to a panel of experts who will evaluate um, the outcomes of, of the individual and the group work. So <clears throat> how does this look in practice? Uh, once the students have uh, finished their desktop study, have looked into all of the geological aspects, the uh, logistics and the planning, um, they would go on a field trip and the first sort of um, station at the field on the field trip would be to visit the local office of the Geological Survey of Finland in, in Rovaniemi in the northern part of the country. And they would then in a group present what they have done to the actual experts in the field to people who have worked for decades on a certain um, um, metallogenic belt. And I guess this interaction between students and um, local experts is absolutely invaluable because they will, students will get the feedback from uh, these experts to find you in their, their workflow, their interpretation, and they will be pointed out, point um, scope for improvement and so on. So this feedback is, is really, really important. And in the industry, you would call this perhaps mentoring and, um, uh, and you know, a guidance by, by uh, senior professionals. As I said, they will then get a practical overview of uh, greenstone bells in general. You can see on this map here, a lot of this map, geological map there is green. So it's just um, reflecting the different um, basalts and uh, volcanic, metavolcanic rocks you see in experience in a, in a greenstone belt. And importantly, uh, connecting field observations with geological maps. And in case of greenstone belts, of course, structural interpretations derived from magnetics is, is essential. So I'm trying to teach the students there um, to think in, in a, a number of dimensions, uh, taking into account different data sets that are available and how we can actually crown truth the results of a magnetic survey interpretation exercise in the field. Uh, the students they also participate then in a in a practical sampling exercise that's usually in conjunction with a with a local company. The company um, wants a few samples to be collected for their own project, and then usually twenty or thirty students will be on site. A little army of geologists who walks through um, a license area and collect samples, as you can see here, quite challenging at times. And that's again where these apps that I talked about before come into play. And students use the apps they developed beforehand a few months earlier and can really use them in the field and see whether these apps and these databases they're constructed are fit for work or need to be improved. And of course, again, the interaction with companies will also expose them to other practical techniques such as core logging, describing rocks, maybe a bit of geomechanics and, and, and so on. This whole concept of uh, the Finland exercise, I've, I found it to be so um, successful at MSc level that I decided with uh, SEG student chapter last year to organize a, a MIDI boot camp, if you like, um, which runs through this entire concept in, in, uh, in just a week's time or so. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't go into the field due, due to COVID, but that is postponed. But um, such a, a large module at university can, of course, be um, synthesized into maybe one or two short courses. And, the, and uh, that could be, for example, number of days learning about the data investigation techniques, followed by a, a few other days in the field, carrying out the field work as I've just described to you as part of the uh, master's program. But this whole educational um, um, and module delivery is not everything in my opinion. Um, students need to apply 
the knowledge they gained during a, their postgraduate study in a certain, well, in a research project. You need to demonstrate once more that they are able to academically excel and um, improve their ability to critically evaluate data. And that's how I really define the difference between an undergraduate student and a postgraduate student. A postgraduate student will need to demonstrate satisfactorily demonstrate that he or she can critically evaluate and reflect on data and put this into the larger context of science and of uh, geology, if you like. So some of these applied research projects that have been generated for students over the years um, have been really variable. And I would like just to showcase some, some examples to you here. One project looked into IOCG deposits in Northern Finland, actually. And uh, the students had the opportunity to carry out some field work um, in this particular area and using core from a, from a governmental core store. And the student used the skills in um, hyperspectral um, mineralogy and geochemistry, core logging and 3D modeling in coming up with um, uh, quite a nice uh, model for a certain deposit that wasn't um, co constructed before. So um, that established regional controls and further exploration targets for IOCG deposits in, in Northern Finland. And um, the student who carried out this project, um, I supervised him and I found that um, I didn't really have to tell the student a great deal more because he had the skills already to go out, confidently collect the samples and analyze them and produce that model. And I think that's, that's well, an ideal case scenario. There was another uh, research project developed again in conjunction with a local Finnish company where um, the student looked into an orientation study um, for a, a geochemical survey program um, and the student investigated the ap application of different digests in geochemical sampling. So that was um, uh, wheat leeches, um, ionic leeches, uh, aqua regia digests and so on. And um, with the help of the company on the company's ground, um, the student developed ideas for which of these digestive techniques is actually giving you the best signal to noise ratio for, for exploration in this terrain. And of course, also use advanced statistical treatment of the data, such as this um, simple principal component analysis that you see on the bottom here. Um, and uh, really helped the company to, to understand the data better while everyone else in the company was quite busy logging core and going about their daily jobs. Another project resulted from the desktop study that I uh, explained earlier on in the um, greenstone belts in Finland you of course also have a number of chronitic intrusions. And um, if you know greenstone belts a bit more around the world, you will see that there are often granites that are rich in, uh, in rare earth elements or even LCT pegmatites, but no one has yet been outlined in a particular greenstone belt in, in Finland. So the idea was to actually generate conceptual targets um, taking into account the data that is available and uh, perhaps investigate whether um, a particular area is prospective for such a, a, a mineral deposit style. I mentioned these GTK data sets that the students use uh, uh, quite a lot. So maybe I, I quickly sort of introduce them to you. Um, you can easily Google them. Um, it's called the Haku database. And it's quite a nice overview of um, all the reports, all the old map drawings and the spatial data that is available or that is made available from the, uh, from the geological survey. And um, really, I think if you want to design such an exercise, 
need to ensure that the data coverage is appropriate uh, for the purpose. If you do regional targeting, you need to have uh, regional scale data sets. If you want the students to do more detailed targeting in, I don't know, 30 square, in a 30 square kilometer area, you of course have other um, requirements that you need to tick beforehand. So I think I'm um, almost through with my slides. I just wanted to summarize what, I've, what the talk was about. Um, so we talked about the idea of providing geoscience students, especially postgraduate students with the skills they need to excel in industry. And um, most of the students well, you've got the statistics down there. In 2019, 90% um, of the students who did this job or did this course, they found employment within Europe or Australia within three months of graduation. I think this speaks for itself. Um, I, I see nowadays with COVID that um, these target generation skills are really important and companies who want to set up projects, they seem to want to have reviews of data sets. So um, being able then as a student to know exactly what to do when it comes to data interpretation has helped them to secure jobs over the last few months. And um, for me as a teacher, this is um, a, a very encouraging and it's satisfying in a way to see that um, students know what they do they go onto a site or they uh, scrutinize a data set and uh, really can contribute to the success of, of a company. Okay, I think, um, yeah, that's it from my side and I'll be happy to uh, answer any questions you may have. Benedict, thanks so much. Um, I personally wish I had a course like that when I was at university. The same with me. <laughs> I wish I had something like this previously. So there are a couple of questions in the chat, um, which I'll read out to you. And then everybody else, you're more than welcome to just unmute yourself and, and ask Benedict some questions. Um, but I'm going to start with Butella, who wants to know whether the tertiary institutions should introduce a course in 3D modeling. And I think this, this question came right in the beginning of your talk, okay. um, using one of the mainstream software packages. Yeah. Given the pace at which technology is evolving, yeah. I think exposure at this level may be beneficial. Yeah, absolutely. And um, as part of the CSM courses, students get access to training in MapTech, Vulkan, and um, Datamine or LeapFrog and other packages. So it, it is very, very important. And most of these software providers um, they are actually happy to make this available to universities at a sort of a discounted rate. Um, so I, of course, can encourage um, tertiary ed educational institutions to um, make use of this and to uh, include this into their, their curriculum. Um, yeah, absolutely. Some of, some of, the, comp of the software companies even have uh, training data sets available that um, sh just show the right am amount of scope and um, technical content to make it not too overwhelming. Um, I, I'd just like to add to this. So we're very happy to be add, um, introducing iGAS, which is a ge geochemistry oh, yeah. package yeah. to all the universities in South Africa mm. uh, this year and including training. So yes, these things are happening. Uh, just keep your eyes out for them. So no, Butella has no, been very active on the chat. Um, can, can I just add to this, Nolene? Please, yeah, Benedict. Yeah, yeah. Um, sorry. Yeah, IOGAS is, of course, extremely important. I mean, that's the first thing I introduced at CSM when I arrived there, that we all have access to IOGAS. Um, just the amount of um, yeah, different data squeezing you can do is is phenomenal. Well, you could use the R software, but I guess if Reflex has these agreements, I think um, universities should, um, yeah, should uh, make use of this by all means. Yeah. So yeah, we're very happy to be introducing that this year. 
Um, so the next question, are students made aware how elective subjects can affect one's career path? Uh, sorry, say again. Are students made aware how elective yeah. subjects can influence one's career path? Yes, yes. So I'm, I think that's probably uh, relating to the different module choices. Yeah. And um, okay. yes, so uh, students, when they enter, well, at least this course that I'm running, they, they are sort of told at the beginning um, what each module or elective optional module, what benefit that has and um, how that can influence their, their later career path. So there's an example of um, a module at the moment, they can choose either the database management or a module about, uh, it's called mining the future. So all the, the different techniques that are, will become important in future in mining and in the mining industry. So um, yeah, they, they are basically being shown what, uh, you know, what different elective module can lead them where. Okay, so the next one's quite an exciting comment, and I'm pretty certain, Benedict, you would have some idea about this. What if there was a social media app that anybody could access via Google Play or Apple by enabling the capture of georeference surface lithologies? Geoscientists could embark on a global surface mapping exercise. Would this be a platform where students can engage with experienced geologists? I definitely know of a number of countries so geological service of a number of countries who have such an app available that at least it was a few years ago and anybody could download that app and could add observations and other comments on it. So I think if I'm not mistaken, this is in production and it's of course uh, would be a great, a great addition to um, even hobby geologists, students and professionals. To, to, to choose from, almost like a Google Earth for geologists. All right, Patella, thank you. I'm gonna leave your questions there and give somebody else an opportunity now. Uh, Benedict, there are some more uh, questions and comments in the chat if you'd like to have a look at that later. Are there any other questions or comments for Benedict? Liam, would you like to just ask the question? Mm. He's I, can making see, me work. I can see the question coming up. Okay, the, great. Uh, yeah. I was just going to say they're making me work very hard today. <laughs> no worries. Um, so the question was, I read it out. Um, so universities in South Africa are often focused around the predominant activity research field in their respective region. Uh, for example, UCT, Marine Geochem versus WITS Applied Geology. Do you believe your methodology could be applied to other fields of geoscience? Additionally, is geoethics being incorporated? It's a great question. Thanks you very, thank you very much, Liam. Well, first of all, I can comment on this from perhaps the oil and gas perspective. A similar concept has been run for a number of years and it's called the so-called Imperial Barrel Award. And I think it's run by Imperial College London, or they set it up originally, and they do a similar exercise for oil and gas fields around the world. And it's quite an international competition exercise, actually. But in other fields, I, I'm sure that something like this could be set up um, for environmental geology, for marine geology. It just needs the, the research or the lecture to define a specific um, topic of interest that could be implemented. Um, I could, for example, imagine an environmental exercise around a contaminated land site where students perhaps even gather their own data in the field, do a bit of soil sampling analysis with a PXRF, and um, then work this whole procedure as an, you know, a, a contaminated land study. If you like. So yeah, I think there's scope to expand this into other uh, geological areas of expertise uh, depending on the university. Um, you mentioned is geoethics being incorporated? So 
at our institution, geoethics is incorporated as part of what's called the professionalism module. And that is a module that all students have to do and they learn about different aspects of working in a professional manner. And that is, for example, time management, dealing with different uh, uh, team compositions and cultures, and also geoethics. And um, that has the, the creative view of making the students aware what the eligibility criteria later on are actually for chartership. In the UK, it's uh, uh, be becoming a chartered geologist through the Geological Society of London. In South Africa, it's the SACNASP. Um, uh, thing so um, absolutely geoethics needs to be part of a of a bigger course concept if you like um, and then would there be any scholarships for international students for this course um, there are a number of scholarships advertised they are largely based around i think they're called the international excellence scholarship and there's a commonwealth scholarship for international students um, from a commonwealth country and um, there are also of course um, the uh, achievement scholarship that's quite an attractive one um, it pays literally for everything um, for all the expenses so yeah i would recommend um, looking into the evening scholarship and the local Exeter scholarships advertised on that website. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Benedict? Any comments? Right, Benedict, it seems that you can now go and give your next class. I think I will do this right now, yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you again for your time and for a really interesting talk. Um, I'll be in touch to arrange your next one. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you. And if there are no other questions or comments, I think we can end the meeting. Thank you very much, Nolene and Greg.